Our next keynote dives deep into the nuts and bolts of what design thinking can do for a big organization. We'll learn how Pitney Bowes, a 100-year-old company, is using design thinking to drive real business impact. We'll hear from the CEO of Luma Institute, Chris Passione, and Ruth Frank, the VP of Customer Experience at Pitney Bowes. Chris, Ruth, take it away. Vice President of Experience Design at Pitney Bowes. I'm here today with Chris Paccioni, CEO of Luma Institute. Hello, everyone. And I'm going to share with you today our journey at Pitney Bowes to client experience excellence and our partnership with the Luma Institute to democratize design thinking across the company. At Pitney Bowes, our mission is to reduce the complexity of shipping and mailing. Since our start in 1920 with the very first postage meter, we have been transforming the way businesses send packages and mail. If you've ever worked in an office and used a device to print a stamp, printed a shipping label or, or stamps online, or if you've ever ordered something from companies like Nordstrom, Quip, eBay, Victoria's Secret, and other e-commerce retailers and, and marketplaces, then you've most likely benefited from Pitney Bowes products and services. Last week, Pitney Bowes turned 100 years old. And in the years leading up to this milestone, like many longstanding companies, we underwent a digital and business transformation so that we could stay relevant in the modern digital world. Our products, services, technologies and business models all changed so we could keep profitably delivering relevant value to our clients. At Pitney Bowes, we have a great culture, starting with our core values around doing the right thing the right way. But we realized that there was something missing, true client focus. And without that, we were delivering client experiences that fell short. Clients were getting frustrated and we knew that without action, they would start to leave. Today, we have a client-centered innovation program based on design thinking, and we see tremendous energy and momentum. People love it. They get it and they want more. We have over 125 design thinking practitioners, as well as advanced facilitators and instructors across the business. That energy is driving more human-centered innovation. Employees have told us that we are a more client-focused company than ever in our corporate-wide employee engagement survey, a significant, significant difference year over year. And this change in behavior is leading directly to outcomes for our teams and clients. This hasn't happened overnight and we still have a way to go. Culture change takes time. And we've learned that we have to be patient with the pace of change. But we've built a strong foundation and we're excited to see how this program drives the culture change that we need as we enter our next 100 years. So getting to this point has certainly been a journey. Going back to 2018, we had a small team, limited bandwidth and a small budget. To get started, we needed a strategy a partner and executive support. We already had an experienced design team known across the company for helping teams craft great client experiences. This team was already using the principle of design thinking every day, but it wasn't enough. We needed to bring along teams and leaders from across the company so that we were all practicing human-centered behaviors every day in every way. We needed to democratize design thinking so that people would have the mindset, the skills and tools to bring design thinking to their everyday work. But we learned that our stakeholders didn't really care about design thinking per se. They cared about the outcomes that a culture of design thinking would create, like client satisfaction, operational efficiency and revenue, key elements of our strategic transformation. So we needed to articulate a clear purpose that our senior leaders would understand because it was tied to results. So armed with this, we rolled up our sleeves and got started by sharing credible industry analysis 
that ties client-centered methods to business results and that a focus on the customer pays off in a tangible way. Forrester has found that a group of client experience leading organizations outgrew the revenue and stock performance of their CX lagging competitors by more than five to one. In addition to revenue, these CX leading companies increased customer acquisition and retention and recognized higher cross-sell and upsell opportunities than their lagging competitors. And firms who practice client-centered methods reduce design and development time by 50 to 75%. They yield faster time to market, encourage an empowered and engaged workforce, and have stronger internal processes. With growing buy-in for client focus throughout the company and executive sponsorship, we established a client experience center of excellence in CX Council so that we could establish a corporate-wide vision and engage CX leaders from various functional and business areas across the company. We identified key capabilities which were critical to executing on our vision, such as an omni-channel strategy, innovation methods, strong data and analytics capabilities, reporting, voice of the client, culture and collaboration. We engaged business leaders into our CX Council to ensure that our vision was informed by the business objectives and that we could measure results of projects and initiatives in a way that was meaningful. We started a drumbeat of storytelling and created opportunities for all employees to see the change and learn how to engage. We want to see a culture change from client focused to client centered to client obsessed. Underlying this, the client centered methods that we chose to scale throughout the organization were those based on design thinking. The approach to problem solving that keeps the humans at the center, our clients, our partners, our consumers, and employees. We wanted to empower more people throughout the organization to leverage empathy, imagination, visualization, and to be curious, collaborative, and iter iterative. We set out to instill behaviors such as broadening the aperture on a problem instead of diving into obvious solutions or the way we've always done things, the quick, the quick fix, taking time to frame and reframe problems and iterating towards innovative solutions through testing, learning and experimentation. Next, we considered possible partners on this journey. To make the impact we needed, we wanted to leverage a tried and true approach that has a high chance of both early and sustained success. We researched, we benchmarked, and through this process, we had an aha moment of our own. With backgrounds and experience, research and design, our team were experts in design thinking. But as we thought about what it would mean to introduce design thinking to non-designers, we had to be humble about our own expertise. We had to step away from our, our own deep understanding and our day-to-day -day work as designers and start thinking about behaviors that would apply to anybody in any role. And in the end, we chose to partner with Luma Institute, who approaches design thinking in the same way. Luma Institute helps us do this by converting these behaviors into concrete, actionable ways of working that we can apply to both major strategic projects and to day-to-day -day work. Many design-focused and client-focused companies have worked with Luma and have generated significant positive client and business impacts like we have. The Luma approach takes our six key design thinking behaviors and combines them in simple but powerful ways, offering specific, tangible, concrete, transferable, and widely applicable activities that we can all do in our daily work every day. Yeah, so if I could just add here, you know, at, at Luma, uh, we believe everyone designs who, as Herb Simon said, uh, devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Uh, yeah, sure, products and services are designed, but so are programs, so are policies, so are laws. 
So are sales plans and marketing plans. Uh, everything human made is designed. And, and in a world, um, or, or a company for that matter, um, that is you know, teeming with so many opportunities for change, we found that the best way for organizations to teach and scale design thinking is number one, first by awakening everyone in your organization to the fact that they design, <laughs> right? And, and Ruth, if you would kind of go to the next slide, and, and two, um, teaching them a flexible system of universal design methods that can be applied in all kinds of situations uh, and work processes uh, to just about any design challenge that they face. Now, you know, many organizations teach design thinking as a process, um, but we believe in doing so, um, they, they run the risk of reducing what is actually a mindset uh, that needs to find expression in one's daily work into an orthodoxy uh, that can only be used in, you know, in a specific way or for specific problems. Instead, we promote uh, something called the Luma system, which is a collection of 36 design methods organized into three categories. Uh, looking methods. Uh, these are methods for observing human experience, uh, which helps teams keep their work human-centered, you know. Uh, understanding, these are methods that help teams analyze and synthesize, you know, which helps teams make sense of complex situations and problems and making methods. These are methods for, you know, envisioning the future, envisioning future possibilities, which helps teams imagine and prototype the future. Um, and, and what we do is uh, with our clients is customize programs with them that teach people uh, how these atomic techniques can be combined in a variety of ways and, and used uh, uh, in work situations and a variety of work situations to help people, you know, empathize, question, be visual, imaginative, iterative, and collaborative, whether that's a Google design sprint or a brainstorming session or, or simply a weekly stand-up meeting. Thanks, Chris. And so mm -hmm. we've been introducing skills to the organization as part of our client-centered innovation program. We introduced this program in its first year at our annual top leadership conference, where we exposed over 160 leaders to several of the techniques we teach in the program. Using these techniques, these leaders generated over 1,600 ideas and 28 concepts to solve key business issues in just four hours. Many of these concepts became work streams, which the business executed on throughout the course of the year. With the exposure to the language and methods, our senior leadership can create the conditions for design thinking to flourish. Design thinking has been an element of this senior leadership conference for the past three years. And it has been important for us to also engage our CX leaders and key client facing and client touching teams throughout the organization. Their engagement and support is critical to drive and operationalize culture and behavior of change. We've introduced broad web-based training to the entire organization. So as you can see, we've customized the way we rolled this out from awareness and introduction to executive hands-on sessions and targeted teams to develop more deeply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ruth, if I may, I just want to um, quickly build on your comments about leadership and their role in carrying out an effective innovation or design thinking program. Um, and a familiar analogy uh, I'd like to invoke is one of sowing seeds in soil, right? Because training of this kind is very much about planting seeds in people, uh, which, you know, without proper soil conditions will fail to take root uh, and flourish. And, and this is all by way to point out how vital it is for leadership to, to number one, understand um, what kind of seeds are being sowed, right? So what are we growing here? And number two, create conditions for these seeds to flourish into actual behavior change, which is what we want. And, and, and I'll give you just a one example. Um, in these programs, one of the things we teach is how to build prototypes, test them, iterate on them, of course, you know, early and often and, and, and constantly, which inevitably involves failure, right? However, in a work culture filled with people who are not comfortable with failure, combined with leaders that do not give its people explicit permission to fail, 
and celebrate the learning that is the true value of this iterative behavior, then they will be less inclined to do that, right? So, you know, once a leader understands, um, in this case, the critical importance of just iteration in her role in programs like this, it, it, it's it, her role in programs like this is to, to look for evidence of this behavior among her teams. And if she doesn't see it, it's to be consistent about requesting it and, and rewarding it. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's, it's so important. And it's really part of the culture change that, that we're aiming to keep going with is around taking risks, but learning, you know, failing, but then taking those learnings and insights and moving forward. Um, so how have we rolled this out at at Pitney Bowes. Well, we started together with Luma in planning a, an initial pilot program. These were energetic two-day workshops followed by a series of coaching sessions. And we were very careful in selecting the 40 participants for these pilots. And the choices we made helped solidify our executive support. So first of all, there were no designers in the pilot program. We wanted to reinforce the message of democratization and applicability to all parts of the organization. We also selected participants who were interested leaders, critical thinkers, and in some cases, skeptics, who would be honest with their feedback and tell us if they believed this approach was a good fit for Pitney Bowes. First, we pulled in key people like our head of learning and development, whose expertise would help us and whose support we definitely would need. Secondly, we pulled in client-focused leaders from many functions and business areas who we thought would be most vocal once they'd gotten their feet wet. Third, we invited cross-functional teams who regularly work together, increasing the chances that they'd bring design thinking back into their everyday work. The pilot sessions were fine and ultimately were a success, but there were aha moments there was pointed and honest feedback. People experienced problem solving in new ways. And they agreed that with tweaks, this was a good fit for our organization and we should continue. And coming from diverse functions and teams made their votes far more compelling than if they'd come from our design team alone. We asked our pilot practitioners to apply design thinking to the business problems that they were tackling and share their challenges and wins. One team through journey mapping, ideation and prioritization was able to reduce the complexity of one of our client onboarding experiences, reducing the onboarding time from two days to 10 minutes, increasing business value and delivering a frictionless client experience. And we were amazed to see that there were participants who were so excited and felt so empowered by the methods that in one case, she showed up on the second day dressed as superwoman. And as many of our practitioners showed interest in advancing further, we developed a group of internal design thinking um, practitioners, facilitators, and teaching experts. We continue to partner with Luma's fantastic design thinking coaches and instructors, but we share with Luma a goal to create enough in-house expertise that we really own it here. Many on our own experienced design team were already experts, but we needed them to also use the same shared language and to have experts beyond that one team. So we're offering pathways for advancement within the program. Our instructors and facilitators are now starting to teach and coach our next generation of design thinkers. Yeah, this is great. I, I absolutely love this picture. Um, and I just want to add, if I may, you know, our, our mission with every client is not to be a training company uh, for them, but rather an accelerator for them. You know, um, for us, success is uh, signaled when our clients are empowered uh, to the degree that they stop relying on us for training and begin to fine tune uh, the programs we help them stand up and leverage the people we've trained to teach and help others. And, and when this happens, Luma happily transitions to a more support role. Uh, and, and we do this because we have found that companies trying to foster design thinking across 
uh, its work culture fare much better when they shape how they are teaching to conform with their specific culture and industry and, and engage uh, key internal stakeholders in the, uh, in the proliferation of these practices. Absolutely. You know, we also found that it was important to, in order to make design thinking, we need to keep things relevant. And we did this with a drumbeat of storytelling within the curriculum itself. As people came through the program and applied design thinking to their work, we began in incorporating stories like the one I shared earlier about simplifying that onboarding experience back into the curriculum. And we started to talk more about how design thinking relates to the processes and methods that people were already using in their day to day work, like Lean Six Sigma and Agile. We found it was easier for people to see the relevance when taught in the context of a problem and business space that they could relate to. We also showed relevance in the way we executed the program itself. We drank our own design thinking champagne and designed the program as a service, just like we would for clients. The trainings and workshops themselves were human centered in the way that they help people learn. We considered the whole experience from the tone of our emails to the gluten-free options provided at the lunch, workshop lunches to humanize every touch point. Our participants experienced what it feels like to be part of something human-centered as they were learning. So we articulated purpose, got started, and focused in pockets to make it stick and are finding that it is working. First, we see tremendous energy and momentum. People love it. The vast majority rate the program at a nine or 10 out of 10 based on likelihood to recommend. It's kind of our own LUMA net promoter score. And we are continuously asked to speak about design thinking to teams the company and senior leaders are asking how their teams can get involved. Set that energy being more human-centered innovation and we are getting internal and external recognition for it. Just last week, this program was recognized internally in our annual Innovation of the Year program as one of the 2020 Innovation of the Year winners for process innovation. Externally, the Design Management Institute and Design and Innovation Awards have recognized our program. We are deeply honored to be among the finalists in the cultural transformation category announced yesterday. Third, change in behaviors leading directly to outcomes for our teams and clients, and our design thinking adopters are generating these outcomes. Finally, these outcomes are helping to improve our relationships with our existing clients, acquire clients, and generate revenue. So it's working. But you know, we don't always get it right, and we are continuously learning. There are three key learnings that I'd like to share. First, go deep before broad. Okay. Got ahead of myself. All right, go deep before going broad. Sounds like the opposite of design thinking, I know. But I'm referring here to the targeted audience or the participants in the program. We definitely learned through trial and error that we see more success in selecting and developing teams in key parts of the business deeply versus a broader set of individuals scattered across the organization. Secondly, meet teams where they are. Some teams have experience and are ready to learn and apply quickly. For other teams, the introduction of one done well is just what they need. For other they may benefit from ongoing coaching. Third, celebrate every success. The big bang successes with clear business outcomes are easy to celebrate, but it's equally important to celebrate smaller steps, those learnings and failures, as Chris pointed out, along the way. We're seeing that this builds confidence 
and it recognizes the risks that the organization is taking to work in a new way. It instills a deeper understanding of design thinking and the everyday applications. So like all of us here today, we started 2020 with a vision and set of plans, which were quickly disrupted by COVID-19. New challenges and opportunities immediately emerged. Being in the shipping and mailing business with clients from small and medium businesses, as well as the Fortune 500, we saw several things happening at once. Our small businesses were looking for financing options and turning towards our online offerings. We saw a sharp spike in fulfilling e-commerce orders as the world turned to more online purchasing than ever. With the volume of orders, there were delays. Consumers were calling our call centers who had little experience with these kinds of calls. Call handling time was up, as was agent frustration and attrition. But one of our contact center managers was a design thinking practitioner and he engaged the agents on his team in an ideation session where everyone could participate and provide their input and ideas. Through this, they were able to create a number of potential solutions, prioritize them, test and learn. And they saw success in the results of decreased agent attrition and call handling time. This was a win for both client and employee experience. And like many others, we are thinking about the future of work following this period of 100% remote work. We've stopped using the phrase return to work as we don't believe we're, we will be working as we were pre-COVID, at least for some time. But we don't yet know what this new way of work will be and the role of the Pitney Bowes office in the future. As our human resources, real estate and business leaders are starting to envision this work from Office 2.0, our design team has been invited to the table to ensure that we leverage design thinking to define and execute on the vision in a human centered manner. Yeah, Ruth, I, I think that's great. Um, it's yet another signal from Pitney Bowes leadership about the central importance uh, and value of design thinking uh, uh, in your organization. You know, the future of work is here <laughs> and, and that includes the need for better creative collaboration, no matter where you are working in remote as well as in person situations. Um, you know, your, your employees certainly need to learn how to function in these new environments like Zoom or MS Teams or Mural or Miro, but more important than the tool or, or place their meeting or workshop uh, may take place is how they are continuing to be empathetic, questioning, visual, imaginative, iterative, collaborative, and so on in them. Um, you know, we, we live in a VUCA world, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, um, and, and, and a world where design thinking is as important and relevant as ever. And uh, your people have to be well versed in practicing design thinking, applying uh, design thinking in multiple ways in, in multiple environments. So I'm happy to see this. Yeah, it, it's exciting to see the the organization um, really embrace design thinking um, in many ways and um, product innovation into experience innovation journey, and it will continue to be. But we are shifting culture and seeing results and are grateful for our partnership with the Luma Institute. Thanks for joining us today. And we welcome you to reach out, ask questions, and share your experiences as well. Mm -hmm. Have a great rest of the day and enjoy this amazing conference. Thanks, everyone.